Let's talk a little bit about a story that is making the rounds now from the New York Times, and we'll do that with uh, Paul Siegert, managing partner of PCS Advisors, to offer some thoughts about that. Good evening, Paul. Good evening, Jim. The uh, gist of this story is that uh, in late summer, uh, the Trump administration declined an offer from Pfizer for more doses of its COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, if so, of course, now we have word that uh, Pfizer is advising this country that, uh, well, they, they've got some for us, but uh, others spoke up first, and uh, and maybe uh, we won't get as much as uh, either uh, we had hoped for or as much as we wanted. Uh, so that uh, would certainly put the New York Times story in an, an intriguing and unfortunate light. Yeah, that's true. We, if, if they naturally, the administration kind of denied that at first. Now there's enough corroboration of that that I think it's accepted to be accurate. And we had purchased, pre-purchased 100 million doses from Pfizer, BioNTech, with the option to purchase 500 million more. And Pfizer came to offer the opportunity to pre-purchase an additional 100 million doses and that was declined uh so that's uh that is i think pretty big news really well it it certainly it certainly is Uh, uh, do we know why we would have declined i mean uh, was pfizer uh, charging an exorbitant amount i mean uh, uh, one one searches for any possible reason (laughs) i'm with you on that I don't believe it's a it's a matter of that. Although I think we have certainly seen some more unorthodox approach to uh, to negotiation, you know, with this administration. I think it probably falls into that category. Uh, the the pricing of the vaccine is expected to be similar to the flu vaccine, uh, you know, forty dollars in that range. And it's uh, obviously this is a huge arms race when it comes to the pharmacy world. There, if we with this undertaking end up vaccinating. You know, 50, 60, 70 percent of the world's population, it's a, it's a massive event. And this could put us could put us behind. I think it's part of normal negotiation or at least this administration's approach to negotiation. And then also they anticipated the fact that we likely will have five vaccines that will be approved by February for emergency use and distribution. Uh, so it's not uh, it's not that we won't have any other option, but. Certainly, it would be better to have more than you need than not enough. Yeah, not to be a a complete American chauvinist pig, but uh, quite frankly, uh, the rest of the world can wait, as far as I'm (laughs) concerned. Let's face it, Pfizer may be a a multinational, but it is an American firm. It is headquartered in New York City. And uh, uh, again, uh, this notion of, uh, of, of everybody in the world gets an equal first shot at this, then that, that maybe maybe Pfizer would like an equal first shot at some other country in terms of uh, of uh, stability of uh, the economy, uh, the workforce, stability of uh, the currency, and, and so on. I mean, uh, again, the, this notion of, of we're just going to put it up for bids uh, strikes me as, uh, shall we say, uh, something less than, uh, well, the, the patriotic thing to do, quite frankly. Yeah, you know, we fund 70% of or seventy percent of the innovation medically in the world comes out of this country and we allow these companies like Pfizer to essentially charge much higher amounts for the service they provide in this country than they do around the rest of the world. So we're essentially funding all of that R and D that the world benefits from. So I oh absolutely. I mean we we could pass a law we could pass a law people worry about the, the drug price gap with uh, other countries. We could pass a law that simply says no pharmaceutical may be sold in this country for more than what it is sold for overseas. And no pharmaceutical company could possibly ignore the American market. And so they would have to lower our prices and raise those overseas. And wouldn't all those European and uh, other parasites just really hate that? I mean, I don't know why we've not... No, I, I have no idea why we've not done this up till now. Yes, you... What... Uh, what Paul just said is exactly true. You wonder uh, why you're paying those high drug prices? It's simple. Developing pharmaceuticals is very expensive, and other countries have simply placed caps on how much you can charge for those drugs in those countries. And so you, taxpayers, or you, in this case, consumers, are paying for all of that research and development and let uh, the consumers in other places not pay their fair share. And and that's wrong. And, and as I said, the answer is simple. 
I mean, the piece of legislation I just mentioned right there, you could have printed that on a postcard. Oh, there's no question. I mean, we're funding, when you look at their profits, their global profits, north of 70% are made on the sales in this country. So without question, the American consumer is their most valuable customer. And we're not capitalizing on that. You know, I refuse to believe that that you and I are are just that smart, and the rest of this entire country hasn't already thought of this. There has to be some organized opposition that somebody is listening to. And for the life of me, I can't imagine what would be organized opposition that anybody would pay any attention to. You know, we've got – there is certainly a movement in this country that works to control this kind of – this kind of this huge sector of our economy and, and rein in these costs. But the power that this medical complex has to lobby both sides politically and and really prevent free, uh, free market from taking hold, it's it's, it's I, I seriously question that level of power. Power ultimately comes down to delivering votes. Sure, they can contribute all kinds of campaign finances, but if your opponent is saying that uh, the incumbent uh, U.S. Senator Smith here is is opposed to making your other countries pay their fair share, there isn't enough in the way of campaign contributions to rescue that kind of candidacy. I mean, I, I seriously, I seriously doubt that level of power. When you are are pushing an idea that is so bankrupt and bereft of any possible benefits, I mean, you could contribute a billion dollars to my campaign, but if you're going to sink me in the process, what do I care? Well, there's, I, I do not disagree with that. And with Trump, we have recently uh, he brought forth this rule to that most favored nations rule that will affect the Medicare purchasing of, of drugs and put them in line with the best prices that are offered around the world. And Medicare is the single largest purchaser. I mean, the U.S. government is the single largest purchaser of, of prescription drugs. So that's absolutely a move in the right direction. Uh, but we need to take far more action in that, in that same direction, as you pointed out, industry-wide. And it could be done. We just need people that are in those positions to write that law. It would be as simple as you say. I, I, I mean, that, seriously, that I don't. I don't think. Impact. I don't think there's enough uh, enough uh, uh, scandal baggage on a candidate out there. Let's say you're an incumbent senator and you've been charged with molesting Girl Scouts. But if you come across with a plan like this, I mean, I, how would anybody vote against you if you, in fact, demanded that other countries pay their fair share of drug costs? I mean, seriously, I just, for the like of me, politicians are in business to be reelected. I cannot imagine an issue that is more of a guarantee of reelection than this issue. I, I'm, and, and it doesn't matter how much money. You know, you, you would have to tell the pharmaceutical countries, you know, I really appreciate all those contributions you used to make, but, but anybody who takes your money to fight this is going to going to lose. And, and I'm sorry, I'd rather have the office. So, yeah, I mean, I I definitely see what you're saying. There is it's a big problem. We're funding the world in terms in this situation, and and our overall in terms of innovation and and the drugs that are you know these miracle drugs that are coming out. We're funding the world, and now we are. In, you know, shoot, look at the uh, summit. President Trump wanted to have, hold a vaccine summit today, and Pfizer and uh, Moderna both simply declined it. Yeah. So it's uh, it's a it's a crazy world we're in today. Uh, quickly, uh, uh, we'll pause after this, but uh, just as a matter of curiosity, do we know why they declined to attend? Well, uh, they I think they expected that it would be they would be under pressure to do exactly what we would expect them to do, <laughs> provide provide vaccines to this market that has supported their R&D and growth and stock growth and, and revenues for all these years uh, and, and give us some sort of priority. Well, then, I and, mean, it seems to be they're the ones who ought to be, uh, who ought to be feeling the pressure. Uh, uh, I mean, Donald Trump is not exactly subtle in his uh, delivery. If he were to say what you and I just got through saying for the past several minutes here, uh, that would be a, a serious black eye for uh, for people like Pfizer. Without a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. Another and, kind of another well, element to this is the fact that some of these, they're not all U.S. companies. You know, Pfizer's really the distribution arm in this situation, and Although they are an American company, but but even beyond that, even if you're not an American company, you cannot ignore the American market. 
if we refuse to allow the sale in this country of any drug that uh, was uh, was not uh, priced the same as in other countries, no drug company can ignore the U.S. market. Without a doubt, that's a yeah. fact. The U.S. consumer is, is the most valuable consumer there is, period. I mean, so, I mean, again, the, the, the leverage is all on our side. Well, for what it's worth, I've had my little say, and uh, I've mentioned this to various members of Congress from time to time, and... Uh, and uh, you can see all the good that I've done. So, anyway, we'll pause and uh, we'll uh, come back with uh, some more, including some calls for uh, Paul Siegert. As again, uh, we are now uh, uh, on the edge of uh, getting the vaccine in this country. In Britain, they've already opened the door, and we'll talk some more about that at one eight six six five zero Jimbo, one eight six six five zero five four six two six. One eight six six five zero Jimbo. One eight six six five zero five four six two six. As we talk about a story in the New York Times that the Trump administration declined an offer from Pfizer in late summer to buy more doses of the COVID nineteen vaccine. Uh, let's talk to Sharon in Crane, Missouri. Hello, Sharon. Hello, Jim. You know the president and his administration. They paved the way for these companies to be able to bypass a lot of the requirements that they were going to have to face Mm -hmm. so that they could get this done faster. And it wasn't just government money. Dolly Parton contributed a million dollars to the development of the vaccine. So it's not just government money. It is also private money. And the fact that Pfizer turns around and thumbs their nose at this country basically is disgraceful and i'll tell you what if it wasn't for the fact that they make so many of the different medications that are required i'd tell them to go pound sand well again i mean if we had the offer to buy some more late this summer i mean we should have taken the offer all that you just said is certainly true but uh we don't know under what terms that it was and what the deal was supposed well, to be. Well, now it would be a heck of so, a good time for the administration to explain that. It would be. It would be. But I, I tell you, I, I have had it with the pharmaceutical companies. We've been taking it in the neck for years, and we have been financing the medicating of the world to our own detriment when we have people in this country who can't afford their medicine, and I know people who don't get benefits, who can't afford to buy the medicine that is going to keep them alive or at least keep them halfway healthy. It is a disgrace. I have no sympathy for Pfizer at all. Thanks, Jim. All right. Thank you, Sharon. Any comments, uh, Paul? Well, I certainly understand her position. We and and also the fact that perhaps we should have purchased more and when the when the administration was asked their response the the head of the operation warp speed said he frankly didn't know why they didn't purchase more at, when they had the opportunity which isn't much of a response well no I mean, if that's the answer that he didn't know why i mean if he doesn't who would i mean apparently we purchased 100 million doses well there are 330 million people in the country so you know do the math that's right, and and when Moderna, we all expect that the Moderna vaccine will also soon be uh, approved, and we pre-purchased 100 million doses there. We expect that we'll have 40 million in in circulation and distribution, and we'll be inoculating folks with those 40 million doses. It takes two doses, so that'll handle 20 million people. We'll be able to do that by the end of the year. And then the order, the kind of the hierarchy that we're going to go through, first in line would be frontline health care workers. We have 21 million of those. And so it's not even quite enough to handle that 21 million. And when you look at the way what our pre-purchase, as compared to the European Union, the European Union has pre-purchased, in, they have contracted 1.6 billion doses. 1.6 uh, billion 1. doses, and the population of Europe is uh, is what, about... Uh, 
what, four hundred million maybe, something like that? Yeah. Way more than, than needed. So they've got a surplus essentially. Yeah, well that all right, uh, to Tom in Port Angeles, Washington. Uh, good evening, Tom. Hello, Jimbo. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. One question, and I'll make it brief for your for your guest. And you just came out of the the waves up here, so but but you're still on uh, the 1580 kilohertz. So and you're booming in. Well, I'm glad that the we're booming in. Is, yeah, okay. The, 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 the question I have is this. Are my antibodies my property? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the intersection of law and medicine. Well, okay, Paul, heck, go ahead. Uh, are Tom's <laughs> antibodies his property? <laughs> and what about his uncle bodies well, while you're at it? You know, I would say they are. We and but the real question is, I think a follow-on question to that would be, well, if you have been exposed and you have antibodies, how long does that protect you? And we don't really know. You know, it could be that it's this is an annual event that we're, we'll be going through, much like the flu. And uh, there's a lot of unknowns here, and that's yeah. uh, you know, there's a lot to find out as we go. I mean, you know, if I t if I, for example, take a flu shot. Uh, and I, I have antibodies, but but no one has ever suggested that that they should uh, extract my blood and uh, and use it for some other purpose. Uh, or I mean, for that matter, I've never even heard the notion that someone who's taken a shot could sell their blood. I mean, or or whatever it is that supposedly contains all the antibodies. So I guess I'm not sure, Tom, quite uh, what what the application of this is. Put another way. Are you there, Tom? <laughs> yes, yes, I am. And and I did have a follow-on question All in right, case that you know. I, is somebody coming after your antibodies very quickly? Uh, not not without a price tag. That's for sure. All right, because I but, anyway, uh, go ahead. The the, the, the follow-on question yeah. is: Are antibodies more suited to the ethnicity of uh, the the the, the purpose person that made them are they more valuable to the person that is uh, genetically sim similar? All right, an interesting question. We're coming up on a break, and we'll come back and we'll uh, we'll approach an answer in just a moment. Similar ethnic background. I've never heard of such a thing, nor have I, frankly, heard of, of a major trading in uh, in other people's antibodies. I, I thought that the most uh, effective way was to get antibodies of your own. But uh, again, for whatever it's worth, uh, what about that? I'm not aware of any any ethnic breakdown of this sort of thing. Yeah, I don't think that that is an issue really. Uh, we do when President Trump got COVID, he uh, got some therapeutics that uh, included some antibody therapies from Regeneron uh, that in the hope is that those aren't yet proven to be effective and in, in, in wide distribution. But the, the hope is, and the early signs are, that if you were to receive these antibodies, which could be from donated plasma from someone who's had COVID, or they could be uh, from, you know, monoclonal antibodies where they're kind of recreated outside of the human body. But in either case, what the hope is and what it seems, the way it seems to be going is that were you to receive these antibodies when you had early signs of COVID, early on in, in developing the disease, that it would uh, keep it mild and prevent you from going into a severe case. Yeah. Certainly, well, I... the, the you know, getting these vaccines out is a more likely far more effective way to deal with it. Yeah, I know. I know the statement made by the uh, Science Advisors Office of o Operation Warp Speed that the administration's strategy has always been to select six different vaccines to build a portfolio to manage the risk that uh, some may work and some may not work, and that if in the summer, which is when this offer was apparently made, somebody had come to us and said let's buy more of this vaccine or that vaccine uh, no one reasonable would buy more from any one of those vaccines because we didn't know which one would work and which one may be better than the other well uh, that may have seemed reasonable then 
But uh, now uh, Pfizer certainly is in the front ranks of all of this, so we'll see how reasonable, I guess, it turns out to be. Uh, Rand in northern Idaho. Hello, Rand. Good evening, Jim. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, I was uh, uh, curious about uh, something I was thinking about here was the uh, distribution of these vaccines. Now, of course, I wholeheartedly endorse the, the fact that we're going to try to get into our healthcare workers first. And I don't want to seem self-serving or selfish with my question, but as a 60-year-old teacher that's still going into the classroom every single day, feeling the need to keep our schools open and try to educate our kids the best we can, I wonder if there's a comprehensive uh, laid out plan from anyone in the government as to how this distribution will take place and how priorities will be established. Is is there anything? Uh, well, God help me if you say if the government's going to be taking care of well, it. Well, I'll put it this way. Uh, I, think, I think probably state governments are going to be taking care of it. As I understand it, the vaccines, uh, uh, Paul Siegert, are to be apportioned out based on the population of the states, and that each state will then uh, uh, parcel them out. As I understand it, the general game plan most everywhere is, number one, uh, health care workers, and number two, uh, the elderly and others with uh, pre-existing conditions. I am not aware of, uh, of teachers as a group, as Rand suggests, having been mentioned as one of the priority groups, but uh, you tell me. Yeah, I think what, we've, what we know is that there's an organization, ASIP, that's a committee that informs the CDC as to what they believe would be the best way to distribute the vaccine. And they have said healthcare workers would be first. We have 21 million frontline healthcare workers, and we will not have enough doses to do that whole group this year, almost enough. Uh, and then after that would be those in nursing care facilities, skilled nursing facilities, and so on. And there's about 3 million in that group, uh, and then other frontline workers. So uh, you've got in that food workers, you've got uh, folks in law enforcement. Teachers uh, are thought to be in that group as well. Now, one sure, teachers are thought to be that, in that group. Okay, go ahead. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, you'll have frontline workers, and that'll include educators. And okay, the well. one kind of interesting factor there is that you've got. ASIP that recommends how it should go to the CDC. The CDC puts together their recommendations. They send those out. They distribute the vaccines to 64 jurisdictional immunization programs. That's basically one for each state, and then you've got territories and so on, and some major metro areas that have their own. And then they really, each each jurisdiction has its ability, its own ability to, to say, yeah, we're going to go along with that, or we're going to tweak it a little for our area. It's right. widely thought they'll, they'll follow the CDC's guidelines. So. Okay. Uh, to Mark in Eureka, California, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I had two questions, but the first one, I, you talked about other countries paying less for medicine developed in the U.S. Did you say you knew why? Could you please explain that? very simply again. Yeah, I can explain it very simply. We have no cap on those prices, and the other countries have uh, placed price caps on how much you can sell a given drug for in those countries. And so the dr drug companies, not unreasonably, have said, well, okay, it costs us a lot to develop these various pharmaceuticals, and uh, there's a pretty high attrition rate. That is, you know, you, uh, you, you develop several of them, and they, they may not uh, pass muster. And so uh, uh, often, you, just to, to find effective pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals that are safe, you wind up developing several, and many of them you just have to dump because they didn't didn't prove out. And so the drug manager just said, okay, uh, we, we want to keep the European market or the Japanese market, what have you, so we'll sell them drugs at their capped price, and we'll make up the difference on the American consumer because there is no limit here. And I, I simply note that you could pass a law that said that no drug can be sold in the United States for more than it is made available overseas. And the drug companies would therefore have to uh, cut our prices and raise those overseas and, and force the parasites in Europe to pay their fair share of the cost of research and development. So that, in a nutshell, is, uh, is what I'm talking about, Mark. So I guess the question is, yeah, you know, why they wanted to keep those European markets? But I guess well, because there, there are a lot of people there; they got money. That's why. Yeah. Well, I thought they could do better, but 
Okay. Well, that was the big one. I, I thought they could get them to raise their caps or something. And Why the would they do that? One, Why would the Europeans raise their caps when, when the United States is willing to sit on its haunches and just simply say, okay, go ahead and, and stick it to us. We don't care. And that's what our government has been saying. I mean, why should why should the pharmaceutical companies change their way of doing things? Why should the Europeans change their way of doing things, especially with with the drug consumers over there that love the cheap prices? When Uncle Sam has, has said essentially, "Yeah, we're suckers. Go ahead and take us for a ride." Well, what does Uncle Sam get out of it? I guess is the... well, Uncle Sam, uh, I don't uh, stupidity. I, I guess uh, you tell us, uh, Paul. Well, it's it's extreme. It's in, as an example a month supply, generic month supply of insulin. Typical dose in the U.S. is about three hundred dollars. If you are across the border in Canada, it's about thirty dollars. And what a huge issue, systemic problem that I see is I believe in the free market, but we don't have a free market when other countries are willing to regulate that price and set a lower price and then they're making up for it here, as Jim has said. A free market would be that it's free all around the world. Well, not, the or not free, but, the, but the prices are determined by market factors. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah. right. Uh, and uh, again, I mean, uh, this is a paying proposition for any politician to campaign on this issue, that no drug may be sold in this country for anything more than it's sold for in other countries. I don't care who you are. You could be a murderer. You could be a child molester. But if you if you campaign on that, you're going to win re-election. I mean, how simple is that? <laughs> There's no doubt. Uh, I mean, it's boy, on track yeah. to be as high as 50% of our health care costs in the next two to three years. And the next uh, the time, you, the next time your, your, your member of Congress or your two U.S. senators are in your area with a town meeting, go. Ask them. We'll be back in a moment. Show at 1-866-50-JIMBO, 1-866-505-4626. As we continue our discussion tonight with uh, Paul Siegert about uh, the new vaccine, uh, the late the first of which uh, will be the one from Pfizer. And here is Martin in Huntsville, Alabama. Hello, Martin. Hey, how's it going, Jimbo? Fine, thank you. Uh, yeah, we, y'all were talking about the antibodies uh, earlier, and uh, the way they make it sound is if you if you get COVID once, then you're pretty much immune to it. Is that well? Now right there is in the indication that some may be and some may not be, but uh, I'm not aware that uh, that uh, that that means that by getting somebody else's antibodies, you would be better off than you would be getting a vaccine. I'll defer to Paul. Yeah, I think the vaccine is the surest route that we're aware of, and the antibodies is more of a therapy once you've been infected to minimize the impact of the infection. So uh, that would be the uh, uh, the uh, the answer in uh, in that particular case that this is uh, is a more effective way uh, to uh, to get uh, protection uh, to uh, Kevin in Farmington, Missouri. Hello, Kevin. Hello, sir. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> We're fine, thank you. Okay. Well, I'm calling about the vaccine, and, mm-hmm. and my thought about it. My right. thought is, I don't know anything about it, and. Uh, uh, COVID apparently, and I'll do that I'm I'm sorry, COVID is apparently what? Uh, he, he dropped. Uh, okay, well, I'm sorry, Kevin. Did you were you were breaking up? You call back, Kevin in Farmington. One eight six six five zero Jimbo. One eight six six five zero five four six two six, and we'll see if we can uh, answer uh, whatever your uh, question uh, turns out to be. Uh, in regard. To uh, the process of approval that has taken place uh, so far, uh, Paul Siegert, uh, uh, I remember that Anthony Fauci initially uh, made a statement that sounded as though he was casting aspersions on the the British procedures as opposed to those in this country. He later <laughs> tried to uh, to apologize his way out of that, but his initial words still still sounded that way. Uh, 
your your thoughts? Uh, did he misspeak the first time, or are are in fact uh, our uh, procedures more uh, stringent in terms of uh, approval of of a vaccine? Well, I think we'll. It was pretty widely expected that we would approve it, as did the UK, and, and I expect we'll approve all of the same vaccines. Will get approved in both countries, which is some sort of an answer to that. We have 17,000 people that work at the FDA. The UK's equivalent has about 900 people, and they shouldered a lot of that load of doing this kind of work for the entire European Union that they're leaving, of course, at the end of this year. And they they took advantage of the of kind of that part of the agreement they have as part of the European Union that you can, in an emergency situation, separate yourself and make decisions as your own country in, in these types of cases. And so they were uniquely prepared amongst the European Union countries to do something like this, and they also approach it differently. We look, we let the drug manufacturer do their research, put it all together, present it, and then we have this enormous staff that goes back through it and examines it all from front to from start to finish to confirm that it is correct and accurate and safe and so on. Whereas the, Europe, the UK was doing rolling they were doing this rolling approach where they were interacting with the drug manufacturers all along the way as they were developing these vaccines. In fact, uh, I, I've heard that the response times were as quick as 10 minutes between when Pfizer and BioNTech would provide them new data and when they would come back with some questions about the data. So they were doing that so that as soon as it was through, they would be nearly done with their, as soon as it was developed, they would be nearly done with their approval process. So it's really a, a very efficient way to approach it. Stay with us. More to come. one 866 jimbo one 866 We'll be back in just a moment. Back to Jimbo Hannachone, one eight six six five zero Jimbo. The administration response to this story that uh, the administration failed to purchase uh, additional units of the Pfizer vaccine was that they were hedging their bets and uh, betting on all the different vaccines, and they would be foolish to buy more of one as opposed to another, which may have looked uh, good back in the summer. Uh, it looks less good now uh, that uh, Pfizer seems to be in the front ranks of those that will be approved. Uh, Kevin in Farmington, Missouri, did call back. Hello, Kevin. Sir, hello. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I was just calling. I was just calling to say that uh, I don't know what to believe about this vaccine. I'm. Uh, I had uh, COVID myself. COVID nineteen. Uh, you had COVID nineteen. There, there are many. Yes, sir. Okay. I was sick for like five days. Uh huh. And. Uh, Ended up uh, doing fine, and uh, it, it was uh, uh, I tested positive on the tenth, but I was sick from like the first to the fifth mm-hmm. of November, and I took a, a test on the tenth, and I'm fine. Okay. Well, now in terms of someone who has already had the disease, uh, perhaps you could tell us, Paul. I'm not sure how high on the list they would be. I would think not very high in terms of availability, uh, since uh, since Kevin apparently has developed some some antibodies, and the rest of us, of course, are are trying to develop antibodies. So, uh, would he even be on the likely list of uh, of immediate uh, recipients of this vaccine? Well, really, the, the strongest form of of immunity is to have had the this kind of a disease and recovered. So, uh, you, you definitely wouldn't be high on the list, and you likely wouldn't even need to to get the uh, yeah. vaccine. It's a moot point for you, Kevin. Uh, congratulations on your survival, and uh, again, your. Uh your uh, apparent uh, leg up on the rest of us in that regard. Getting the disease, of course, is not the preferred way to develop the antibodies. Uh, to uh, Philip in Lenox, South Dakota, good evening. There. Uh, I guess I just got a couple comments, not really any questions. Okay. Uh, first, of all, first of all, my comment is, regardless of what Trump or the administration does, 90% of the media is going to say it's wrong. And as far as purchasing the amount that he purchased from the one company 
to me that makes perfect sense because when you've got two or three companies developing a product, you don't know for sure who's going to have the cheapest because just a minute ago you guys were saying that we pay too much in the country for our pharmaceuticals. So why not? Yeah, but we pay too much for pharmaceuticals because of price caps placed on other by other countries on on all kinds of pharmaceuticals, not just this vaccine. That's a a different issue in terms of the pricing. We're getting royally screwed on drug pricing in general. Right. So that's why at this point in time, why would you want to buy a big lump sum from one company? Because this is not just your any up? other. This is not just any other pharmaceutical. This is a vaccine for something that's disrupted our economy. I mean that alone. I'll put it this way. If they had offered me that, again, I don't know how it looked back in the summertime. Do they all appear to be equal equal uh, contenders? Uh, you tell us, uh, Paul Siegert. Uh, was that a wise bet on the part of the administration? Since apparently that was the bet, it now appears that they bet wrong. But at the time, was that a smart bet? Well, we have some uh, reports from a board member of Pfizer that the, that they, the company – made multiple offers to the administration to allow them to pre-buy an additional 100 million doses that would have been intended for the second quarter of 2021. Mm. And along with that offer, they provided uh, further research that showed that it was looking that this would be an ineffective vaccine and and would be, mm -hmm. you know, would be where it is today. So there were some indications at that time that they were provided more and stronger data right. about the development and chose not to pre-buy. Okay, uh, so apparently there was some evidence, Philip, that uh, that they may have bet wrong, but uh, we understand your argument. You, you had a second point, I believe? Well, my question would be then, if, we, if we've got 330 million people in the United States, is that what you guys are using for a number a little bit ago? Well, 328 million, whatever, in that ballpark. Okay, all right, so if we take the number of people that have already had the uh, corona, if we take the number of people that are wouldn't take the shot even if it was offered to them, how many doses do you think we need if 100 million is not enough? Well, they need two doses each. So that's uh, 100 million will handle 50 million. And we've confirmed cases. Certainly there's more people that have had it. There's asymptomatic. Many of us have had it and may not have known right. and were asymptomatic. So it's hard to, right. to judge what that number is. Exactly. Uh, you know, and we also, 12, it's hard to judge the number of people who, in fact, will not uh, will not uh, take the vaccine, hopefully not a large number. Uh, and that elapses our time uh, for this hour. Again, uh, uh, Paul Siegert, our guest, and we'll continue with more here at Westwood One.